We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Jackie Bailey. <laughs> to ask the First Minister what engagements he has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Well, later today I'll be visiting the Institute of Sport to meet the athletes and coaches who played a vital role in this summer's Commonwealth Games. The Games in Glasgow was an outstanding success, both in terms of its organisation and the way in which it engaged hundreds of thousands of people in enjoying the, the biggest event Scotland has ever hosted. I, I'm delighted to announce to the Chamber, in addition to being the greatest Commonwealth Games in history, it's come in almost £25 million under budget, hey. making it the, one of the few major sporting events in history which have managed to achieve that accolade, and, second, and certainly the only one which has been both the greatest games and come in under budget. <laughs> Jackie Bailey. Can I associate myself with much of what the First Minister has said, particularly that our athletes did us proud? I have a suggestion for how he can spend the savings. Can the First Minister tell us whether the number of teachers in Scotland has gone up or down since 2007? First Minister. Well, as uh, Jackie Bailey should know, uh, in terms of the arrangements we've made with COSLA, we've managed to hold to the teacher-pupil ratio that was outlined in the uh, agreements we made. Uh, I think that is a, a considerable achievement uh, in the face of Westminster austerity cutbacks. Uh, and, uh, and I know that uh, Labour councils were the most enthusiastic in responding to the Scottish Government's urgings in maintaining the number of teachers. Jackie Bailey. Like three excuses in one, and I suppose that probably falls into the First Minister's category of the most accurate answer anybody has ever given in any parliament, and we know what nonsense that was. So the First Minister knows I am a kind and helpful person, so let me help him out here. Between 2007 and 2013, the number of teachers in Scotland dropped by 4,000. That's 4,000 fewer teachers in our classrooms teaching our children. And it is the poorest kids and those who need the most support who will suffer. The experts are worried, presiding officer. They don't agree that this is because of falling school rolls. On Tuesday, the teachers union, the EIS, told this parliament every week pupils are sent home because of a lack of teachers. The National Parent Forum said the poorest people, pupils will be worse off and get less support because of the cuts. Now, the First Minister won't tell us the truth about the drop in teacher numbers. Maybe he can perhaps be more forthcoming about another issue. Can the First Minister tell us whether the total number of people going to college in Scotland has gone up or down since 2007? First Minister. Well, the uh, number of teachers in Scotland in 2011 was 51,212. These are teachers employed by local authorities. Uh, in 2012, 51,100. In 2013, 50,932. Uh, that means that COSLA and Labour councils across Scotland and SNP councils have kept to the agreement of maintaining the teacher-pupil ratio at the 2011 level of 13.5. I, I, I think that is a, a considerable success uh, against yeah. the austerity cuts that Scotland has suffered from Westminster. Uh, and I would think, given that that is part of an agreement which encompassed uh, the leaders of councils across Scotland and the, the Scottish Government, I would have thought uh, Jackie Bailey would acknowledge that her party has some part in the maintenance and the success in maintaining teacher numbers and the teacher-pupil yeah. ratio in these circumstances. And I hope that Jackie Bailey is prepared to, to celebrate the huge and substantial successes of Scottish education, yeah. the record exam results, the hugely promising and effective introduction of curriculum for excellence, the, the fact that the concentration of our college courses on, the, on courses which give people full-time qualifications is one of the reasons that we're seeing such hopeful signs in the decline, the huge and substantial decline in youth unemployment. Because, of course, full-time college places have been maintained in terms of the full-time equivalents, as we promised in our manifesto. These are substantial achievements, not just of the government, but of the teachers, the lecturers, and the pupils and the students across Scotland. Yeah, yeah. Jackie Bailey. Could I suggest the Minister, First Minister doesn't hide behind the pref professionals involved because they are the ones making the complaints about his education system. Do you know, if I was a teacher, the First Minister's report card would be marked 
lacks attention, could try harder, and can't even <laughs> grasp the basics. So let me, let me tell him about the college experience, because the reality is the number of college students in Scotland has been cut by 140,000 since 2007. That's 140,000 fewer people going to college and making a better life for them and their families. He knows there's a cut. I know there's a cut. The people watching at home know there's a cut. The First Minister dodged my first two questions. How about we go for third time lucky? Can the First Minister tell us whether the number of Scottish students going to university from the poorest areas of the country has gone up or down in recent years? First Minister. Actually, uh, substantial improvements in exactly that ratio, yeah. thanks to a number of initiatives that the government has taken, in particular the maintenance of the educational maintenance payments, which uh, have been abolished in England but maintained here in Scotland, helping exactly the poorest students in the country. Uh, and of course, the, the Labour Party's checkered track record in failing to support these initiatives, yeah. uh, helping students from deprived families, yeah. is a matter of, of record uh, in this Parliament. The achievements of Scottish education against the significant pressure of funding cutbacks for Westminster is something for which this government is rightfully proud. Uh, and in terms of allocating credit to that for the, the teachers of Scotland, for the introduction the successful introduction of Curriculum for Excellence against that background, then I think I'm allocating the credit where credit is undoubtedly due. I think the government can take some credit, however, for the successful introduction and maintenance and expansion of the school building programme, yep. the Schools yes. for the Future programme. Yeah. You see, I remember Arthur. it wasn't so long ago Arthur. when Jackie Bailey was Health Minister, when our colleagues were questioning our education, when they were saying that we weren't building any schools in Scotland. We now have the figures for the first seven years of SNP government. Against the background of austerity, 463 school building projects completed since 2007. 135 more than the 328 okay. in eight years yep. of Labour Liberal administration. <laughs> now, I know that Jackie Bailey doesn't want to celebrate these new schools across Scotland yep. and the conditions in which our pupils are now being taught, but will she at least acknowledge if we wind the clock back, we wind the clock back to some people in the back benches used to be in the front benches. Really winding the clock back when I look at some of these Labour members. It was the claim of the Labour Party that we couldn't build any schools. They said we weren't building a single school. In fact, we've built substantially more in seven years than the Labour Party mentioned in their entire time in office. Jackie Bailey. Presiding officer, even by the First Minister's usual standards, that was truly woeful, you know? For all, all of his responses, can I just say to him, you're not in the playground anymore, First Minister. You can't say a big boy did it and then ran away. Education is fully devolved, it's your responsibility. Let me just say to the First Minister, his government celebrates percentages. We talk about real people. And here are the facts. The First Minister knows. Order. The Order. First Minister Last knows year, Ms. Bailey. that the number of Scottish students going to university is down by 12 thousand and for those from the poorest backgrounds it's down by over three thousand bursaries are cut by 35 percent student debt is up by 69 percent and despite the first minister's assertions the reality is that okay. he is failing scotland's future the truth is there are fewer teachers giving our children the education they need. Yep. There are fewer college places yep. for people trying to get on in life. Yes. And the poorest people are less likely to go on to university under this SNP government. He should be ashamed. Yeah. Isn't it the case that when the First Minister leaves Butte House for the last time, he should perhaps consider taking the Education Secretary with him? Yeah. First Minister.
Minister. Well, there are, of course, uh, over Order. this term of office, there First have been a record number of students going to full-time yep. courses in colleges and universities across Scotland. Uh, a huge achievement, and in contrast to what's happening yep. south of the border. Thanks to the initiative that this government has yep. taken, we have seen a closing in the gap in terms of the access to our universities and colleges of students from underprivileged background. That has been the point of maintaining the educational maintenance allowance. And of course, that has been proved possible because education is free in Scotland. Yeah. It's we abolished the back end tuition phase introduced by the Labour Party and restored education on the basis of merit and achievement, not on the basis of the size of your checkbook. And I know that whichever candidate was successful for leadership of the Labour Party, one of the first things on their agenda will be the reintroduction of student fees, yes. of tuition fees. Yes. I can just say to Jackie Bailey that will not be tolerated or accepted by the people of Scotland. But I thought the, the point of peak absurdity in the line of Jackie Bailey's questioning, which when she said the Labour Party celebrates percentages. Are they celebrating the 23% percentages? The 23% percentage of people currently voting for the Labour Party. I, I'm told that there are... I heard on the radio this morning... Madam Presiding Officer, I heard on the radio this morning there are scientists at Glasgow University who are researching the expanding nature of the universe. And there are political scientists all over Scotland researching the contracting nature of the Scottish Labour Party. <laughs> From Big Bang to Black Hole, expansion of the universe, disappearance of the Labour Party in Scotland. Question number two. Thank Ruth you, Davidson. Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when he'll next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. First Minister. Uh, no plans uh, near future. Ruth Davidson. Thank you. Presiding Officer, I have questioned the First Minister on school performance many times. In response, he reels off a string of stats, and I say that I know Scotland's schools are good, but that we must strive for better. More choice, more autonomy, and new ways of working. This week, the education expert Keir Bloomer wrote in our new book that calling school performance a success, and I quote, demonstrates the tendency to self-congratulation, which is such a damaging aspect of the culture in which Scottish education operates. There is a whole debate happening out there on school reform that this government is just not responding to. In the same book, a former head teacher pleads, and I quote again, energise and empower head teachers, set them free, give them true accountability. In Tuesday's Education Committee, two parent groups urged the scrapping of local authority education boards altogether. So I want to ask the First Minister, now that he's got one foot out of the door, can I ask him why? Why is he so wedded to councils being the only provider of free education in this country? Why does he believe, why does he believe that there is no better way of doing this? First Minister. One of the great joys of not being First Minister of Scotland is I won't, as a matter of duty, have to read Tory education pamphlets, as I did, <laughs> as I did last night. And I studied the pamphlet in great detail. Let me say, Keir Bloomer, his article, the two cheers, as he put it, for the Curriculum for Excellence, it was actually a very good article, I thought, and I thought it was very substantive. Unlike, I'm afraid, many of the other articles in the pamphlet that Ruth Davidson cites. Uh, and incidentally, I, I didn't feel that doing both the preface and the introduction, as Ruth Davidson did, was perhaps the best use of uh, resources in terms of developing that pamphlet. But what I would say to her is this, that when people in that pamphlet argued that we should adopt the rampant disorganisation and privatisation, according to the National Union of School Teachers, that is being deployed south of the border as the means of going forward in Scottish education, then they mistake absolutely uh, the temper of the people. Uh, and if she cares to study Keir Bloomer's article that she cited, uh, she'll say that he notes, although he says the difference isn't massive, that of course it is a matter of fact, uh, that in terms of international comparisons, in terms of the PISA study, we have arrested the decline yes. that was taking place till 2006. And he also notes on two out of the three measurements, the Scottish performance is ahead of that south of the border. So yep. given these facts, why on earth would anyone in Scotland be interested 
in the advocation by the Conservative Party in their advocacy of adopting the disastrous disorganisation of the English education system far better to pursue the education system we have in Scotland. Ruth Davidson. Well, the First Minister clearly didn't read Professor Lindsay Patterson's entry where he compared the two and said, and again I quote, Mr Gove's public preference is the more compelling. It's interesting that the First Minister references the Keir, Keir Bloomer uh, essay uh, and talks about the PISA study because he goes into that in some great detail. And he shows in that that the year that this Parliament started, Scotland schools were performing well above the international average. And since then, we have dropped 20 points in reading 35 points in maths and nine points in science. Our young people are less able to compete now than they were at the start of devolution. We must do better. So why does this government dismiss the lessons that can be learned from the charter schools movement in Canada and America, the free school reforms of Sweden or the technical colleges of Japan? Across the globe, school autonomy drives up standards. The First Minister sticks rigidly to the one-size-fits-all approach on education. So, rather than self-congratulation, shouldn't this government put its ego aside and learn the lessons from around the world? First Minister. Well, uh, since she, she's quoting Keir Bloomer, then she will accept, as I stated in my first answer, that he notes that the decline in performance, which was noted between uh, 1999 and 2006, has been arrested in terms of the PISA uh, comparison since. He, he notes that in his article, and she must accept that because it's there uh, in black and white. I, I was interested in the Conservatives' offering of New Zealand and America. Uh, as the uh, international examples we should follow, because in the self-same standards, the PSI examples, uh, then we've substantially closed the gap with New Zealand in the last uh, few surveys, and secondly, we're ahead of America in the measurements. So why would it be a fantastic example to quote in the Conservative Party press release uh, of two countries, one of which we've closed the gap, and the other of which, in the case of America, uh, that we're substantially ahead? Cannot Ruth Davidson understand this? That in terms of the vast expansion of nursery education, Scotland is doing well. Uh, in terms of the exciting development of curriculum for excellence, Scotland is doing well. Uh, in terms of the uh, uh, Inwood Commission, uh, in terms of vocational education and how it relates to the colleges, Scotland has got an exciting opportunity to develop vocational education through the cool school and college curriculum. And in terms of our advocacy of free education, then we've been vindicated by the success of our universities over the last few years. And all of these aspects, Scottish education is performing well. And as we go forward into the future to enhance and improve that performance, let's do it in terms of the Scottish principles of education. And that means that each child should get an equal chance, not have to pay by the checkbook for education, and not go down the road of privatisation and disintegration like the Tories south of the border. I have a number of constituency questions today. As last week, I want to get through as many as possible. So, brief questions and brief answers. Christian Allard. I'm sure the First Minister and the Chamber will join me in sending condolences to families of the crew of the Fraser Butter registered ve fishing vessels, the Ocean Way, which was tragically lost on Sunday, resulting in fatalities. This tragedy is not only a strong reminder that fishing is one of the most dangerous occupations. It also highlights the fact that there are many different nationalities working in our fishing industry today, as for the crew were Filipino. Could I ask the First Minister if the Scottish Government has been involved in helping to contact the families in the Philippines? First Minister. Well, let, let me agree with the, the sentiments uh, expressed by Christian Allard that uh, obviously I'm, I'm a former Member of Parliament for, for Fraser, but many, many members in this chamber have close connections with fishing constituents. Uh, we also like to record the Government's thanks to all those who acted quickly to try and preserve human life, sadly, of course, in vain, and some uh, of the people involved. Uh, the Scottish Government has been in contact with the Marine and Coast Guard Agency and the Marine Accident Investigation Branch since the weekend, including to provide them with information about this particular fishing vessel, which was Fraserburgh registered but fishing from Northumbria. Uh, responsibility for making contact with the relatives of the deceased uh, is a matter, of course, for the relevant police force, in case, this case, Northumbria Police. But, of course, I, I should say that we've already made it clear to the police authority that if they require further assistance in terms of the nationality of those whose lives are lost, then the Scottish Government uh, is anxious and willing to help in any way we can. Lewis MacDonald. 
Thank you very much. NHS Grampian has lost its entire local leadership in recent weeks, both executive and non-executive. Does the First Minister recognise the damage this has done to both staff morale and public confidence in what has historically been an exemplary local health service? And will he, in that context, undertake to ensure that the next chair of the NHS board is someone who lives and works in Grampian? First Minister. Well, the next chair of the uh, NHS board, and I've seen some uh, public offers uh, in terms of uh, who it should be. We'll go through the, the proper public uh, appointments uh, uh, process. Uh, can I say I met the incoming chief executive of, uh, of Grampian Health Board yesterday, and uh, Malcolm Wright assured me that one of his first acts when he takes up office will be to arrange a meeting with local MSPs uh, to discuss the, the way forward for, for Grampian Health Board. Uh, I think that we have to, to recognise, as Richard Carey did in his uh, note to NHS staff, that there had been a, a, a breakdown of uh, relationships between some senior clinicians and senior management in Grampian. Uh, and therefore, he concluded, as others have, that the way forward is to have new leadership in NHS Grampian. Uh, I think we should go forward from there and rally behind the, the new chief executive as he addresses these questions as he fully intends to do. And he comes into post, uh, Malcolm Wright, with a substantial track record in being able to address these concerns. He'll also have, and I don't for a second say that uh, uh, the finances are the key or the only issue here, but Lewis MacDonald will know that historically, a Grampian Health Board was underfunded compared to the Scottish average, 9.1% when we took office. I'm delighted to say that uh, over the next two years, it's going to move to 9.6%, which is much closer to the fair allocation. Uh, he should reflect in uh, all relevance, however, that uh, it does seem extraordinary that after eight years of Labour Liberal administration, that process of underfunding should have continued for so long. And he should welcome with me that in fairness to all health boards across Scotland, the new formula will bring each and every health board to a fair allocation, including Grampian Health Board. John Scott. <coughs> the officer. The First Minister will be aware that approximately 25 jobs are under threat at Presswick Airport as Greer Aviation and Landmark have been served notice to leave the airport by the management of Presswick Airport. Does the First Minister share my concerns about this potential loss of jobs and businesses? And will he ask senior Transport Scotland officials to meet with Greery Aviation and me to discuss this matter and avert the closure of these businesses which have served Prestwick and Ayrshire well and provided a constant income stream to the airport for almost 15 years? First minute. I, I don't think the local members... A depiction of that is entirely the full story, but perhaps the, the best way forward, knowing his interest in the airport, is to arrange the, the meeting he asked for. Recognising, of <coughs> course, that this is an operational matter for the airport itself. Uh, the senior management team are tasked with all aspects of taking the airport forward, uh, including the development of significant commercial opportunities in terms of how the airport intends to develop. Uh, but in terms of relation to the issues that the member raises, uh, then I'll be glad to, to facilitate the meeting that he requested. Liam MacArthur. Thank you very much, President Officer. HIE are seeking to build a number of units in Linus in my constituency as part of welcome efforts to support renewables development. Yet, despite earlier commitments from his government and his enterprise agency, the tender has been framed in such a way as to effectively prevent any Orkney-based firm from competing for this work. He has the power to do something about this. So will he agree to suspend the tender process so that steps can be taken to allow small businesses in my constituency a fair crack of the whip? First Minister. No, but what I will undertake to do is to examine the issue and write in detail to the local member to see if I can help him in his legitimate inquiry. Question number three, Alice McInnes. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, issues uh, of importance to carry forward uh, the Government's programme for Scotland. Alice McInnes. This week, the Chief Executive of the Care Inspectorate, Annette Bruton, warned that it would be a serious mistake to assume that Scotland is immune from the type of child exploitation seen elsewhere in the UK. She reported that Scottish agencies had made progress but are still not effective enough. What discussions has the First Minister had with the Care Inspectorate on the support that can be given to ensure the safety of children in Scotland? And what priorities has he identified for action? First Minister. Well, there was a, a full Cabinet discussion uh, on, on these matters, in fact, the last two Cabinets, and I understand the, uh, 
Uh, the Minister will be making a statement this coming Tuesday. Uh, so uh, Alice McInnes will have uh, full opportunity to press her questions. Alice McInnes. Thank you. And I, I, I look forward then to um, the publication of, of, of some action on that. But people would expect the First Minister to take close interest in what is a national issue. People in South Yorkshire assumed that agencies and committees and working groups were protecting their children. But we have learned that you have to check and double check. So it is right to press the First Minister on this. This is insidious and creeping abuse. Scotland's public agencies still have, and I quote, important and major weaknesses in dealing with the first reports of abuse. What deadline will the national plan set to give Scotland's young people the comprehensive assurance that they will be protected? First Minister. Well, can I, can I say I chaired uh, uh, a long cabinet session on exactly these matters uh, on Tuesday, and uh, a range of initiatives were discussed, in, of course, accepting the announcements that have already been made, for example, the new unit within the the new Scottish Police Service for investigating uh, crime and criminality, which uh, uh, I think is something which uh, will have substantial advantages over the, the variation <coughs> in approach, which was part of <coughs> the difficulty in terms of previous, uh, uh, previous police services. So the single police service gives us the advantage of being able to have the, the specialism and detail of knowledge that that investigative unit will have, and I know that Alison McInnes will welcome that. But the statement that Mr Russell makes on Tuesday will go into a, a range of matters and a comprehensive response. There is no complacency whatsoever in terms of the Scottish Government's approach for these things, and we recognise that everyone in this Parliament understands the, uh, both the importance and the necessity for making absolutely sure that our agencies and our legislation is entirely fit for purpose and see that some of the abuses, which historically have been documented, uh, can be uh, addressed for the, the future, and any weaknesses in our system will be addressed. And of course, in terms of the survivors and the victims of previous abuse, that they will get the justice and the hearing of which they, they rightfully advocate and cry for. Question four, Jamie Hepburn. Uh, to ask the First Minister what assessment the Scottish Government has made of the impact of UK Government welfare reforms on families in which at least one member, fa uh, family member is in employment. First Minister. Well, I think we should start calling them the welfare changes, not the, the welfare reforms. But in, in welfare changes, £6 billion, an estimate is the estimate of the funds that will be removed from the Scottish economy. That is from families in Scotland in the six years 2011-12 to 15-16. Independent projections suggest up to an additional 100,000 children and 150 working age adults will be living in poverty by 2020 because of welfare reform. As a member highlights, households in Scotland are increasingly experiencing in-work poverty. Employment is no longer in itself a protection against poverty. Six in ten uh, children uh, and over half working-age adults in relative poverty in 12-13 lived in households where somebody was working. Uh, and this, unfortunately, is an increasing trend which is going to be aggravated by the further changes that the Chancellor is planning. Jimmy Hepp. I uh, thank the First Minister for that answer. With these welfare changes uh, hitting uh, the poor and many working families uh, hard, uh, the First Minister will be aware of a range of uh, frontline organisations such as the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, Children First, the Poverty Alliance and Engender have called for uh, the devolution of powers of, over welfare to uh, Scotland. Does the First Minister agree with me that this whole Parliament should unite behind these calls so that we can make better decisions here in this Parliament? to improve in these matters and build the fairer Scotland we all want to see? First Minister. Yes, I would. I, and I think, actually, increasingly, the number of people in this Parliament who would say that Scotland shouldn't, not couldn't, but shouldn't control welfare, it will be a diminishing number uh, as people across the range of issues uh, recognise that the decisions made closer to people in Scotland will take account uh, of the issues which the, the member rightfully raises. Uh, I think we should, off these issues, just dwell on the, the subject of in-work poverty. Uh, and we should recognise that the logical consequence, in fact, the inevitable consequence of the recent announcements by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, that thousands more people in each and every constituency in Scotland will suffer a reduction in their standard of living as a result of the changes the Chancellor intends to make. These are people who are working, who will get poorer, as a result of the changes of the Chancellor, which, of course, as I understand it, the opposition in Westminster seemed prepared to accept yes. and to go along yes. with. Thousands of people in each constituency. I think that is an intolerable situation. I am certain 
that no administration in this Parliament would ever countenance such a move. Question five, James Kelly. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government response is to the KPMG study, which indicates that more than 400,000 workers in Scotland are not being paid the living wage. First well, Minister. Tackling low pay is a key priority of this Government. We fully support the living wage campaign. We have, of course, led by example, and for the fifth consecutive year, have required employers subject to our pay policy to pay their staff the Scottish living wage. We should note, uh, as a result, uh, in the KPMG report that the living wage is paid to 81 per cent of Scottish employees, a greater proportion than any other part of the UK out with the south east of England. James Kelly. I thank the First Minister for that answer. I am sure the First Minister will agree with me that it is unacceptable that over a quarter of a million women uh, are not paid the living wage in Scotland. Some of these women are working on cleaning contracts in Scottish Government locations. Can I therefore ask the First Minister, for Minister if he will agree to set out a national living wage strategy and also to urgently review all Scottish Government cleaning contracts to ensure that people in these locations are paid the living wage? First Minister. What a pity James Kelly did not attend my speech at the STC conference when I laid out exactly such a strategy and how the Government intends to roll out the living wage. This Government, of course, which introduced the living wage uh, in Scotland uh, and will be pursuing it for the fifth successive year uh, next April. Uh, it would be wonderful if at some point in his comments and rightful comments in these matters, Mr Kelly would acknowledge that it was this SNP Government who introduced the living wage across the public sector. And indeed, of course, it's this SNP Government who in the recent contracts negotiated for catering in the uh, Scottish Government and, of course, the railways uh, have secured the living wage as part of these contract negotiations. It is, of course, also the case, and I heard Mr Kelly on the radio uh, wax lyrical uh, about the £8 being offered as the minimum wage by the Labour Party, forgetting to tell people it was to the year 2020. In other words, on that, a 2% increase in the minimum wage year by year. It is likely, in fact almost certain, that even an inflation increase would take the minimum wage past that amount. No wonder the Labour Conference and the Leader's speech at the Labour Conference has been given such a resounding raspberry by working people in Scotland. Question 6, Alex Johnson. To ask the First Minister what assessment the Scottish Government has made of the potential impact on the economy of the recent fall in crude oil prices. First Minister. Well, it depends on a number of factors. Final impact on the economy will find how it passes through to investors and to consumers. It would be unwise, of course, to assume that recent law falls will last. Indeed, much of the recent decline is driven not by market fundamentals, but a reaction to temporary oversupply in the market as OPEC tries to force out the production of US shale oil. Indeed, most recent forecasts in the OECD, Cambridge Economics, Standard Chartered Bank and even the CBI eh, are for a bounce back in prices next year. But I wonder if the member would just like to think of how secure our economy would be if we had, like Norway, had the opportunity to invest in an oil fund. Uh, I saw in a Financial Times report this week that every day, every day for the past 13 and a half years, that has grown by an average of $165 million. When oil prices were high, when oil prices were low, the Norwegian oil fund grew by $165 million a day. Would that Scotland had discovered oil at the same time as Norway? <laughs> Alex Johnson. With oil prices today trading, uh, uh, Brent crude today trading at under $83 a barrel, uh, they've now reached a four-year low. That's a 20% drop since the day the First Minister lost the referendum campaign. Will he, uh, having put that at the centre of his campaign for an independent Scotland, a case decisively rejected by the North East where the industry is based, will he now accept that that case has been lost and will he bury the hatchet with the UK Government and work to ensure that the oil service industry has the best of support north and south of the border to weather this storm and return to a successful future? First Minister. Spoken with the authority and the confidence of 8% in the most recent Scottish <laughs> opinion poll. 
Uh, at some stage, the Conservative Party will consider whether a revival to 8% indicates a glowing future. But why is the Conservative Party at such an all-time low? They're at such an all-time low because they seem to suggest that having oil and gas in massive quantities is a curse and an irredeemable burden for the Scottish people. What other people look at is the announcement of new discoveries in the North Sea, the Excite Energy discovery of the Bentley Field with 300 million barrels. And only two weeks ago, British Petroleum announced another discovery in the Central North Sea, something which obviously only became apparent after September the 18th. <laughs> Not to mention today's report in the Press and Journal, which indicates that the latest drilling in Clare Ridge is sowing extraordinary oil well flows. And people from that will conclude that the size of the resource in the North Sea and in the waters around Scotland will outlast the Scottish Conservative Party by many decades <laughs> and will power Scotland in times to come. That ends First Minister's questions. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.